Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we come to you this morning, and uh, we thank you for being an awesome God who loves and cares for each one of us. And so for whoever hears this message this morning, we pray that as you so often do, Lord, touch us right where we're at. Lord, open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear you, and Lord, most importantly, open our hearts. Help us open our hearts so that we can, we can see you clearly and feel your love for us. Help us take what we hear this morning and apply it to our life, that we wouldn't just walk away with with words, but things that we can take with us to change the way that we walk and the way that we see you and the way that we understand you. We ask that now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. Would you turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5 as we continue our study in the book of Galatians this morning? We're, we really came to probably the most important word of the whole Old Testament law summed up in one statement. It's you know, we used to the, the saying one word, just one good word. And that was a privilege to share it last week because we got all the way to verse 14 where it said the whole law is fulfilled in this one word. What What's the word? Do you remember? You can cheat and look down. It says, you shall love your neighbor as your what? As yourself. And it it's amazing how overcomplicated Christianity has made the gospel. For people, I think Jesus didn't make it complicated at all. He he simplified all of those rules that the Jewish people. The, if you have any Jewish friends, anyone here Jewish? I, I got to check first before. Dot. <laughs> ay ay ay. <laughs> of course she is. Yes. <laughs> Irish girl, sure you are. <clears throat> My Hanai mom always wrestling with me. I got to love my neighbor as myself. Okay. This is the word that the Lord spoke. He spoke it to a, a, an attorney who was testing him, saying, what's the greatest command? And Jesus said, it's simple. He said, how does it read to you? And the man said, well, you know, in, in the law, it says you have to love God first and you have to love your neighbor. And Jesus said, good job. Go and do that and you shall live. He didn't make it overly complicated in fact he he went with what the man what the man understood is not neat how god meets us right in where we're at in our understanding and we have such a loving god if our understanding's a askew or it's a little off he works with us he just you know that re you're a little off the track let's get you back on path you know let's get you on that straight and narrow and but when when we come to the lord is any of us perfect? Do we, get, you know, I hate when I see those things that say, when I get it together, then I'm going to go to church. You know, people tell me that sometimes. I'm like, I'll never see you. <laughs> Bye. Because we don't wait to get it together to go seek the Lord. We go seek the Lord so he can help us get it together. And the whole of our Christian experience is so enriched when we follow these simple words that he says, Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it was a privilege to have this recorded last week because Dylan did a great job editing the thing and he put the title, Love, Love One Another. Okay, And then I shared it on YouTube and Facebook as much as I could because we're new to YouTube. And, um, and by the way, I know that the older generation doesn't know what I'm talking about when I say <laughs> like and subscribe, but it's this thumbs up thing. Click the one going up, not the one going down. Okay, thumbs up that you like it, and uh, and that to subscribe he made it really cool. If you click the video, start playing it, you'll see our amazing grace cross going into the globe on in the Hawaiian Islands, and it's in the corner of the video the whole time. And all you have to do is hover over it, and it instantly brings up a window that says "click to subscribe." That's all you have to do, one click, boop. So for you not so tech savvy, don't be afraid. Just click the video and then go to the corner and click the globe and you're in. 
Okay, but that would help me greatly because it gets the word out that we actually made a video to YouTube. If you don't get 10 people to subscribe in the first 10 days, your video is, is kind of like it's like publishing a book that you you got it from the publisher and you took it and stuffed it under your bed. No one will get to read it. They won't know that it's out. You have to publish it and get it out. And the way that they do that in the electronic world is get people who want the book. It's like basically 10 people wanted to ch check it out of the library and they read it and they put it back and, and, and they look for activity. Who's get, whose book is getting checked out? So we need 10 people to check out the video. Well, w gratefully, we got 45 now. So that's like for, for a little church on a beach in Hawaii with, you know, two weeks of YouTube experience. Woohoo! You know, 45, yeah. We have 45 subscribers, yahoo! And we got a few of these. I don't know. You know what? I bet you guys are gonna laugh at me, but see, my degrees in in college from Arizona State. My first degree was in international marketing. They didn't have this internet thing back then. We didn't have to study it. But I do understand the principle of the of the thing is that they're trying to get videos that are getting lots of views because then the the advertisers are willing to pay money to have that because when you click on our thing by the way we enabled the ads and the reason we did that is because it helps promote the viewing thing and it and if you get enough clicks on those little ads somebody checks out the thing and um, then eventually we're gonna be able to pay Dylan because they actually <laughs> give him now you're gonna laugh we have what do we have 27 cents in our account now how much 27 cents Woohoo! We have. <laughs> We, 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 it's clicks per thousand, clicks per melee. You have to get a thousand views to get a dollar or something. But you know, we're working. We got 385 views so far on our videos on YouTube. Fortunately, I have a lot of people I know on Facebook. So who here does Facebook? I just want a quick show of hands. If you have not friended Jan or I, please do so this week, and I'll send you the video from this week. And I'll send you the devotional. If you don't mind helping me, this would help greatly. It's um, Dylan already worked on it last night. It's like two minutes and 38 seconds. It's got a surf scene of Daniel coming in on a barrel. And then it's got one of the other kids at the end and another barrel, you know, and the wave goes over and they're out in the water with a GoPro. So it, you see the, the wave and then it, it, you see the underwater shot as the, as the wave rolls by and it's really cool. And so it's our kids and they want to reach other kids. So they made a cool intro you know, the words of a low, uh, no, it says words of encouragement pops up. And it's from the verse Hebrews 3.13. What's Hebrews 3.13 says? Encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called what? Today. Hmm, that's tricky. Let me think that one through. I have to encourage, well, we have to encourage one another day after day. As long, oh, wait a minute, as long as it's still called today means... I, last time I checked, today was called today. When we were on yesterday, yesterday was today. And when we get to tomorrow, what will it then be called? Today. This is a really tricky way of saying you got to encourage each other how often? Every day. And so we're going to try to make a devotional series for the kids that reaches them. We got permission from Steve uh, Hunter to use the living rhythm, which has got this cool... Beach Boys vibe beat of, uh, you know, it's a good upbeat praise song that goes perfect with the with the surfing stuff for the intro and the exit. And, and we're going to try our best to make um, devotion. My daughter, Joy, is so excited. She gave me 12 suggestions already. Dad, you need to teach this. And you need to do the righteousness piece in Joy Gages. And you need to teach them this. And, and she's going over what verses spoke to her when she was new in the faith. What? What does a new believer, and by the way, I want to ask all of you to help out. If you have a verse that, you know, when you first heard about the Lord, it, it really spoke to you, I want you to share it to Dylan. He'll put it on his on his phone, and, uh, and when we run out of ideas, we'll start, you know, filming little question and answers, and the kids are excited. We got one of these, we got this young lady, she is so on fire for the Lord. She's asking the questions, so pastor, what's it say about this, or... Or what, is there any verses that would be good for someone who's feeling lonely or depressed or, you know, and they're, they're really pertinent to the, 
to the teens. But they're not just teenagers that get depressed or feel lonely. So I'm going to ask you guys to do me a favor. Today we'll try to get that up. Is it almost ready, you think? It's done. Oh, then we're going to put it up today. The little two-minute thing that pops up today, I'll put it on the Facebook. I'll share it to you, as many as you can. Would you just share it to your friends? The more we share it and it goes out, the more they go over to YouTube, check it out, and ask your friends to give it the thumbs up, not the thumbs down, and, uh, and click the sub subscribe button, and more will come. And we'll just get them encouraged in the Lord because it's going to be one of these things I know the kids need every day. They need to hear those things of the Lord. And I got Cookie and Steve doing Young Life. They got a, probably a wealth of good ideas. And, and, and we want the kids to be part of it. We want to put them in the videos, not just me. They don't need to see me. They can see me on the whole long message thing. But for you visitors, when you get home, you're stuck in the snow, got cabin fever, I want you to click on there and just turn on the sermon and look at this wallpaper here. And, and I want you to remember this so you can just kind of bring you back. to For, for our Korean contingent that's going to be leaving us on the 19th of December, you guys, when you're gone... Please click on the Facebook and, and watch and, you know, when you miss us, you can click it and hear, hear the sermon and just enjoy what the Lord has. The word that was shared last week, to love one another, it is truly, I believe, the thing that, well, it says in the last days that the love of many is going to wax cold. You know, in Matthew's gospel, one of the signs of the times will be that people's hearts are going to just grow cold toward their brother and sister, to, to their neighbor. They just want the love that we were intended to have and to share with each other is, gonna, is going to, to wane. People's hearts are going to get hard. Now, is that happening, by the way, right now? Yes. yes. Just happened this week. Just to, the, the shootings that have gone on and the things make my heart just ache. That is not loving your neighbor as yourself. But... Paul had to speak these very words to a church. The church at Galatia, he had to say, you guys, the whole law is summed up in just this one word. And don't let anyone put these bonds on you. Don't let them whip these, these fetters out and try to, to tie you up with all of this extra rules and, and say you must be circumcised, you must keep these days, you must do this certain Jewish you know, steps in the law. To be pleasing to God. Because Paul says, no. What you really have to do is love your neighbor. That's the whole thing. Just love your neighbor as yourself. Now this week, we're going to continue to the next verse. Would you join me looking at verse 15? He says, but, but if you bite and you devour one another, he says, take care. Lest you be what? Consumed by one another. <laughs> I, the word but is a very interesting word. When we were kids, we were told not to say it because it, not, not this word, B-U-T. English is so weird. There's another word but, B-U-T-T. -T. My mom said, you do not say that in public. That's a bad word. Okay. Can I say ass, mom? It's in the Bible. <laughs> I got in trouble for that. Smacked right. I was in Catholic school. The, Jesus rode into Jerusalem. If you look at the old King James Bible that I had, you know, Mom, look right here. He rode on an ass. But I wasn't trying to use it in that context. You know how smart Alec little kids can be. I got in trouble. But, okay. But this word here, this little three-letter word, but, B-U-T, in English class I was taught it's called a disassociative conjunctive. Big words for a little word. It means it. it's taking the side of the opposite to what you just spoke, a disassociative conjunctive. In other words, and it's going to join it, conjoin it to what was just spoken. But not in the way of it's a continuation of that thought, but rather the opposite. It's saying... Okay, love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you don't want to love your neighbor as yourself, and look how Paul words it, 
But if you choose to bite and devour one another, by the way, is that loving your neighbor, biting and devouring one? No. no. If you bite, now no church would ever, ever experience people in their church biting and devouring one another, right? I mean, that's, that's so not church-like. Can you even fathom? But what is biting and devouring anyway? What's that? No, do they taste good? <laughs> Guys, we are supposed to be sheep of his good pasture. And he's our shepherd. And sheep do not eat other sheep. They bite them. Yes, they do. Sheep bite. And if you've ever been around sheep, anyone here been on a farm besides me where you had sheep? Has anyone here been bit on the ankle by a sheep? I have. It's... Oh, I wanted to kill a sheep that day. <laughs> they have these little, their teeth are made for grabbing grass and ripping it from the ground. And then they have these chompers that crush it <laughs> and just grind it up. And they can bite really hard. And, and, and some people don't know this, but they're, they're similar to a dog when it comes to, like you teach them their name, you call them by name, and they'll come. Just like calling a dog. When you shepherd sheep, you don't actually push them and, you know, like, hey, everybody, go that way, go that way. You don't have to do that. You, a shepherd, a good shepherd, just has to say, come. And by name, he can call his sheep and they'll just hear the name and they'll just, they respond like your dog. You know, you're calling to your dog, come, come. Our dogs are Oreo and Koa. So they come, Koa. He's a little slower, but as soon as you shake the food thing, <laughs> he shoots right in. And sheep. Sheep, though it's hard to teach them to roll over and do other tricks and shake and do all that, they, they do have these two things down. They'll come to the calling of their name. Interestingly enough, they'll only come to the calling of their name by the person that they trust as their shepherd. I, if I was the shepherd of a group of sheep and Steve had another flock and he called out his sheep's name and then he tried to call some of my sheep to go follow him, my sheep won't go. They know the voice of their shepherd. Jesus actually said that. He said, my sheep know my voice. They hear my voice. They respond. They come. And if you've grown up in this, you understand it. But if you've never seen this, I had to go to Israel to actually firsthand witness this because we were in Jerusalem just outside of the, of the old city. And they had this little canyon area it was kind of like a little cutout and there was four different flocks of sheep all penned in in this one little uh, small arena i'll call it just a natural arena but the opening was protected by the shepherds they actually lay down in the opening and the sheep won't step over it's like there's the door just like jesus said i'm the door to the sheepfold he protected the sheep well they were in there and the shepherds we're watching them, and I'm thinking, how do you know which sheep is yours? And they looked at me like, you obviously haven't done this enough. And no, we only had a couple of them, and there was an honorary one bit me, you know. And they started laughing. And then they went up, and they started calling to the sheep. And just one at a time, the shepherd would come to the opening and start calling by name his sheep. And wherever the sheep were in the whole group, they start pushing and shoving and working their way through. It's so funny to watch. They just get a little fur balls, just <laughs> squeezing through. And they work their way through, and they come right up to him. And they just stop right there and wait. And after he's called them all to him, he just turns and says, come on. In Hebrew, I'm, he doesn't say come on in English, but he, in Hebrew. And I was listening to one of the shepherds calling the sheep by name, and I was just learning Hebrew. So I was like, oh, oh, I know that one. You know, um. In uh, my daughter's name is Raquel, which is the Italian version of the Hebrew Ra uh, Rachel, which is Rachel. We say in English, Rachel means um, in English or in Hebrew, little lamb. Little lamb is like affectionate. So he called that out in Hebrew, and oh, I know that name. And so the sheep, I watched the sheep make its way, and it went by, and I'm going, Raquel, Raquel, come, come, and it would not come to me for nothing. I tried. Come get over here, you know. And then another one was, was Lee, which is, I don't know why I named it Lee. In Hebrew, Lee means no. 
Ten is yes, Lee is no. And he named one of his sheep Lee. Lee, Lee. And that sheep came right to him. And as it passed me, I'm like, Lee, Lee. I know that word. It's easy. No, no, no. It wouldn't come. Why? Why wouldn't the sheep come to me? It's the wrong voice. The sheep know the voice. And Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. They hear my voice. They follow me. I'm the good shepherd. Now, Paul says to this church, guys, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Just love one another. Love the other person like they're your what? Yourself. You got it. But, and this is that three-letter word, but, on the opposite side of love is biting and devouring one another. And sheep, it is not really becoming of sheep to eat other sheep. You know, wh who eats sheep anyway, normally? I mean, in the whole picture of, what's the predators for sheep? Wolves. And the Bible talks about, you know, looking after the flock, to, to guard the flock. There's an ad admonition to pastors to make sure that we keep the wolves away from the sheep because wolves eat sheep. If you see sheep eating sheep, the one doing the eating isn't a, a sheep. It's a, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. And there's even a warning about that. Watch out for wolves that come clothed in sheep's clothing. But he says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out lest you be consumed. There's a consuming that happens to some Christians because they don't walk in love. That, that opposite of walking in love is biting and devouring one another. It's chewing on someone else in the body of Christ. And I got news for you, we ain't supposed to chew on the other sheep. We're supposed to follow the good shepherd to the pasture that he brings us. Remember Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Where does he lead me? Beside the still waters. He takes me to the good pasture. He, he restores my what? My soul. The good shepherd brings us to the place where we get to eat what we need to eat. And it's not one another. It's those things what we really need to be fed with. He brings us to those things that are nourishment to us. And here, Paul had to tell a church. Can you imagine a Paul, the apostle, having to, to tell the church, quit biting and devouring one another? Do hmm. you think we could use that today? There's some churches, they are biting and devouring one another. They're not walking in love. Now, Paul goes on, he says, but... Here's another but. Now, but is the opposite of what I just said, but there's something else, okay? A disassociative conjunctive. I got another thought for you to think about. But if you walk by the Spirit, listen, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. He says, for the flesh sense its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit its desire against the flesh. For these two are in opposition to one another. Now, you guys have probably heard this. He says, if you notice that our body, we have this fleshly side of us, and then that spiritual man that God has placed in us. And it says the two are at enmity. Let's not mince words. There's a real war that goes on between our flesh and our spirit sometimes. And it says so that we, we are not even able to do the things that we wish to, that we that we please to do. There's just a war. I used to think I was bipolar, you know. Man, I want to serve God, but in my heart, in my mind, there's this willingness, this wanting, and then my flesh is like wanting to say, "No, forget that. Serve me." You know, take care of my fleshly cravings and forget God, man. You got to take care of yourself. It's amazing how the flesh always is interested only in one. One person being served, and who's that? You. The Spirit cares about serving others, taking care of others. Now, as you take care of others, what happens to taking care of yourself? God takes care of it. He, you know, as you take care of others, all of your stuff gets taken care of. 
But when you just put you as the most important thing and you're going to just serve you, you can turn into one of the most miserable people. And you will find out that there will be this struggle. And you will find out you won't even do the very things that you please. Now, Paul the Apostle, he wrote this to the church at Galatia in just a real simple thing. Flesh is against the spirit. The spirit's against the flesh. You can't even do what you want to do. End of story. But I read a book before this book in the Bible where he went into great detail. And i got to take you there today because there's a few young Christians I know struggling with this idea that inside of them there's a there's a war going on and the and the passage i'm talking about is found in romans chapter 7 if you'll turn with me to romans chapter 7 when paul wrote to the church at rome i'm so grateful he he did a little bit more in-depth job on that whole the flesh is against the spirit the spirit's against the flesh and i can't even do what i want he 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 helped me realize i'm not the only one so if you've ever felt this, you ever felt like inwardly your your part of you wants to serve God and then there's this other part of you, the outward fleshly part that gets drawn to go do something wrong. You are not alone. You are not the only person that has struggled with this. Even the apostle Paul writes these words. Look at with me at Romans chapter 7. I'm going to pick up in verse 14. He says, "For we know now that the law is spiritual." He says, but I am flesh. I'm just flesh. Anyone give an amen to your flesh? I'm just flesh. He says, I'm sold into bondage of sin. He says, for the that which I'm doing, he says, I, I don't understand. For I am, I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing what, well, the very thing that I hate. And he says, but if I do the very thing that I do not wish to do, I agree with the law confessing that it is good. He says, so now, no longer am I the one doing it, but what is it that's doing it? He says, the sin that dwells within me. He, Paul was not a man who would stand up and preach, I am sinless. He was a man who would say, yep, I even wrestle with sin that is within me. Now, this is my kind of preacher. I can, under, I can go, yeah, I, I relate to that guy. You know, let's be realistic here. And he says, for the good that I wish to do, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. And, but if I am, the, uh, am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but it is sin which dwells in me. And I find then this principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. He says, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war. And, and, and against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Anyone heard that verse before? Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from this body of sin and death? And what was the answer? Now, don't ever stop right there. That would be a disservice. Read the next verse. Who sets him free? Thanks be to who? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then he says, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am, am serving the law of God. On the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. Now you might say that's a terrible thing to say. He recognized he has sin and that his, his body wants to serve sin. Is that terrible? How, how do we get forgiveness for sin anyway? First, the first thing you have to do is actually acknowledge you have it. You know, if we, if we won't say we have sin, how are we ever going to... Because the Bible says confess. Confess your sin, right? And God will be faithful and just to what? To forgive. But if you want to be one of those people who goes, I don't have any sin. I'm perfect, man. Get, you must be talking to someone else. For those of you who are sinless, you're excused now. You can leave. The rest of the message will mean nothing to you. Because the reality is, Jesse popped up and ran off. <laughs> Mom's like, get back over here. She knows her boy. We all sin. The Bible says we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But isn't it nice to know that even the Apostle Paul wrestled with sin 
in his he knew his bodily urges opposed the very his mind wanted to serve god he said the very thing i want to do i don't do the very thing i do i don't want to do i call this the doo-doo chapter i mean that's what this is romans 7 is the true spiritual doo-doo chapter you find out you got sin and what are you going to do about it well i say read to romans 8 verse 1 because you all know this this is one of the most quoted verses from the whole new testament there is therefore now what no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus this is verse 2 of romans 8 the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do weak as it was through the flesh god did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering of sin he condemned god condemned sin in the flesh jesus it said who knew no sin became sin for us he took sin upon himself all of our sins and he paid for them as that lamb of god what paul what i'm not paul john the baptist remember behold the lamb of god who does what takes away the sins of the world paul says thanks be to god he sent his son to be the offering in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh now but according to what what are we supposed to walk after now the spirit this is one of those things he wrestled with my flesh and my my flesh is fighting against my spirit you know against my very mind i i there's a struggle there's a tug of war going on and you know for people that that have experienced anyone here experienced it besides me i just want to see if uh, i'm the one, no i'm not the only one good Phew. you're not the only one who has felt this pull where your where your flesh is saying just do what i want to do forget them you don't need to love them all the time just take a break you know go go have some fun take live it up live for yourself you know, by the way, those are all lines that the flesh came up with. They're very, you know, you can always tell the source because it's all me, 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 take care of me. Give me this. I'm going to take care of satisfying my, 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 me, my, mine, I, I. What a, what a glorious one-letter word, I. I am the most important thing in my universe. Everything is about me. When you get that mindset, you are in the flesh. And Paul had to talk to the church and say, guys, don't look. The opposite of loving is walking in the flesh. The flesh is a corrupt thing. And the flesh, he's going to go on and describe. And some this is probably the most quoted part of the book uh, uh, of Galatians. He's going to talk about how do you know whether it's the flesh or, or the spirit. And he's going to call all the things of the flesh the deeds of the flesh. And he'll call all the things of the Spirit, the most quoted part of Galatians, the fruits of the Spirit. Now, some of you, I could probably start and say, anyone here know what the fruits of the Spirit are? Name them off. Love, joy, joy peace, patience, goodness. kindness or goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things as these, there is what? no law if you walk in the spirit you don't have to worry about what's the law say to do because you will fulfill the law just because you're in the right way with god your spirit is doing what you, you will do the law naturally but if you walk after the flesh here's how you can tell if you're and by the way this helped me a lot when i was a new christian i used to call it fleshing out <clears throat> i know that sounds too simple but let me show you. When when you're not in the spirit, you're getting into the flesh. That's you're you're, you're basically letting the flesh come out. You're you're fleshing out, letting people see your not so spiritual side. And Paul says this is how you can identify it. He says in verse 18 of Galatians 5, he says if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are these. They're evident. Evident 
Don't even have to try to find them. What are they? They're things like immorality, impurity, sensuality. He says idolatry and sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousies, outbursts of angers, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings again, drunkenness. Boy, envyings comes up twice. Did you notice that? It's not a typo in the Bible, by the way. The flesh, when people envy other people, they're in the flesh. You know, instead of your brother gets a, a blessing, he goes, oh, look, I got a new moped or new car. And some guys are like, oh, man, I wish I had his car. How come he gets a car? I should get his car. Envy is not a good thing because it can lead to coveting. And coveting, oh, that's a wicked sin. When you want somebody else's thing, what God blessed them with, but you want it above even them having it, you get in trouble because you start doing other sins. You're like, how can I get that? You, you wouldn't want to give that to me, would you? Or could I steal it? Or uh, could I just kill you and take it? Or I mean, it's funny what coveting can do. Coveting can lead you down a dark road. I, by the way, I've shared the cure for covetousness before. Some of you might have heard this. The Lord gave me a great insight one time when I was with somebody they they were coveting my brother joseph had a volkswagen beetle um one of those 60s era one with the smaller lights on the back and and, and it was you know we, we, yeah and he had the vented little things and and he had taken the back air scoop i mean the well trunk lid and oh pulled it out and done the little slots and done all that and he was like real proud of his volkswagen and somebody came by and was like i wish i had his volkswagen and then another Volkswagen went, no, I want that one. You know, let's go see, chase that guy down and beat him up and take his Volkswagen. I didn't run with a good crowd, if you couldn't tell. They really meant it. And I was like, uh, that's not such a good thing to do. But then the funny part was when they said they wanted my brothers. And they did not know that my brother started with a piece of jalopy junk piece of Volkswagen to begin with. No, the person who had it before, they never did nothing. So everything was wrong. It all broke. You know, it went the way of the world. It just disintegrated. And we would try to work on it. And if, if you've ever worked on a Volkswagen engine, they didn't make it big enough to put your hands back in there to, to do anything. You can't change points or the ignition, nothing. You're just like, we finally figured out there's four bolts to bolt the engine in to the car. It was faster to unbolt the whole engine and take it out and set it on a tire and do the work over here and then put it back in than it was to try to, you know, like be in, under this little, uh, I can't get in there. First all, forget that. Just pull the engine out. But I had, you get kind of tired when your brother is like, you come home from work and he's like, hey, Iz, I need help pulling my engine again. There's a little piece I want to change. Joe, leave it alone. No, I want to change. Come, come on. I just need some help. Just four bolts. I know the four bolts. I've done the four bolts. I don't want to do it again. And I'm going to be all greasy all over again because it's an old engine. And to hear somebody say, I want his Volkswagen. I'm like, you don't want that piece of junk. God forbid. you. That's like giving you a curse. And I don't want you to have it because you're going to ask me to help you unbolt the engine when you need it done. Get a clean one. Get a different one. Don't covet his thing. If God wanted you to have, he would have given it to you, but he didn't want to curse you with that curse. You know, maybe he has something else better. In fact, here's the cure. If you ever feel yourself desiring something that your neighbor or your friend has, your coworker, your boss, just say, Lord, could I have one? Now remember this. Not that one. One like it, but maybe even better. Just remember the story of my brother Joe's Volkswagen. Could I have one that's not greasy, that's not going to break down, that's maybe even better? Could I have one that looks good on the outside and runs better on the inside? Is that a legit prayer? Is that okay to do without coveting your neighbor? By the way, that helps me not covet my neighbor's stuff. I'm not saying I want, because if you want the exact one that they have, it will lead you to evil. You'll be trying to work angles. How can I get it away from them? Hey, if you ever want to sell that thing cheap or 
give it away. Remember me. Put me on, here. Here's my sticky note. Here's my card. Here, you're going to do whatever it takes. And you'll be waiting for the day if they don't do it. You just kill them and take it. Now, you think that's extreme, but anyone know some of the stories of the Old Testament? When guys wanted something what their neighbor had and... Do you guys remember even there was covetousness of, of um, spouses that went on? Even King David wanting a woman who was another, woman's, uh, another man's wife, Bathsheba, and he winds up going into bed with her and getting in sin and then having the husband put at the front of the, of the army in a ba fierce battle and told the guys to withdraw from him so he would get killed. That covetousness, wanting, the Bible says you shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's goods, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's donkey, ox, any, nothing that is your neighbor's, don't covet it. Because if you covet, if you intensely desire what they have, it'll lead you down the wrong road. But you could be cured from that real easily by saying one prayer, God, could I have one similar not that one, just maybe it's a little bit different. One that you would want for me to have. And maybe he doesn't want you to have a Volkswagen. Maybe he's going to give you a Porsche or a, you know, they're made, these, well, they used to be made by the same guy, but just fancier. Maybe he's going to upgrade you to Mercedes, forget it. Or, I don't know, a Honda. The kids want Hondas now. I drove a Honda in college. When I hear the kids today like Hondas to soup them up, I laugh. Because I got laughed at for driving a Honda back then. Like piece of junk, little Jap imports. When I was a kid, it was not a compliment to drive a Honda. I was like, why don't you drive American? What's wrong with you? You know, I was like, it gets 45 miles a gallon. I'm a college student. It was a good deal. You know, it, it, it was. I had to change the transmission. What, how many times, Jen? Three times at your dad's house? Three, my poor, my poor father-in-law. I literally would drive over with a piece of junk transmission I got from the junkyard to trade it out for the one that was going out. And he would just bear with me like, oh, here he comes, you know, because I needed I needed my father in law's jack and the tools and, you know, and all the stuff to to do it. And God bless him. He is such a patient man. He would just sit there and let me fiddle and learn how to do these things in, in his garage. You know, with all of his nice tools and stuff. As a, a, like, one I only had in for like two weeks. And it was a it was a jalopy. And the junkyard said, guaranteed for a month. I don't care if they guarantee it for a month. You have to still undo all the stuff. Take it out. Bring it back. Go out in the yard. Take another one out of the other car. Bring it back. Put And... I kind of grew to like not liking working on Hondas about as much as Volkswagens. You know, it's like, this is not fun. Lord, could I pray for a car that doesn't run like this? Could I have one that runs good? You know, it, learned, it helped me not to covet anybody else's thing in the car realm. Because you really don't know what you're praying sometimes when you pray for that other guy's vehicle. Ask him. So how dependable has this thing been to you? You really liking it? You might be thinking, that was a dumb thing for me to covet his car when you find out how bad it is. But the flesh, does the flesh covet? Does the flesh envy? Does the flesh have anger or outbursts of anger? We, we would not admit it, but sometimes our fuse might burn short and we might blow our cap. He says there are other fruits of the of the or deeds of the flesh. There's things like drunkenness. That's a that's a deed of the flesh. There's carousings and things like these. And Paul says, of which I forewarn you, just as I now have forewarned you, that those that practice these deeds of the flesh, these things, he says, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The contrast between the flesh and the spirit are so stark. If you walk in the flesh. He says, you're not getting in. But the fruit of the Spirit, and this is the part so quoted, and next week I'm going to go over each one of these in a little more detail, but just to kind of 
what is it called? Like a teaser for next week. Preview. Preview for next week. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, right? Self-control against such things there is no law. He says, now these who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with those passions and desires. And now if we live by the Spirit, just, this is so important. We need to walk in the Spirit. He says, then we, it says, let us, if we want to live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. How many of you have heard of a Spirit-led Christian experience? You know, someone who walks after God's Spirit. They, they're a Spirit-filled person. Anyone heard the, that lingo? You ought to have. It's biblical. It's too bad it's not taught very much. In fact, in America, we have more fleshly-led Christians than we have Spirit-led Christians. But Paul says, if you be in the Spirit, then let us walk in the Spirit. Show it. Walk by the leading of the Spirit in your life. And he ends this chapter with a verse that really shows whether you're in the Spirit or in the flesh. He says, and let us not become what? Boastful, challenging one another, or envying one another. If some guy comes up and says, Pastor, I could have preached that better than you. I'm, I'm a much better preacher, you know. I usually think inside my head, you probably could have, but why didn't you? You know, I mean, but sometimes they're not really doing it in that because they wanted. I'm like, why don't you go start a church and start preaching the word and spreading the word? No, I just want to tell you I'm better at it than you. They they like to throw out a challenge, you know, and the and and the. I could make this church ten times bigger. Go for it. But the flesh is always boasting and always challenging and always envying. And is that what we're supposed to be doing in the, when we get together? Uh, I, I'm better than you are. I mean, I dress way better and look better. and You know, the flesh boasts about everything. This is a stupid little flesh thing we have. Someone says, oh, I can do that. And 10 other guys will go, oh, oh, I can too. Oh, yeah, I've done that. Funny how the flesh is so quick to boast about how great it is. In Christ, I found boasting, like Paul said, it's necessary. But he says, but if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast only of one thing. What's he going to boast about? He says it, not here. In the, I think it's Corinthians, is it? You guys, extra credit. Someone look it up for me. He says, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in the Lord. Boasting, he says, is necessary. Men just can't stop them from doing it. They're always bragging about something. But if you're going to brag, Paul says, if I'm going to do it, I have learned I'm going to boast in what God has done. That's what you want to brag about. You want to really help people's life? Start bragging about what God has done in you. Just say, you know, the Lord helped me get through this struggle I had. Or the Lord freed me from this addiction. Or the Lord took away this hate I had for this idiot. <laughs> and now they're even my friend. I mean, that's a, you want to boast that there's a living God? Sometimes when people say, prove there's a God, I said, he changed me. I look at you guys like you're easy. No problem. If he could change me, he can change you. And that's the proof that there is a God. You guys all know that, right, from the book of Romans? Be therefore, tra be transformed by the renewing of your what? Your mind. Why should you be transformed? That you might prove what the good and acceptable will of, the, of, of who? Of God is. Well, now, what is God's will? Peter said it in, the, in one of his epistles. He wrote, it is God's will that none should what? Perish. God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to come to repentance so they can have this beautiful gift called eternal life. It's a gift he wants to give to everybody. Now, you want to prove that there's a God who wants to give the gift of everlasting life to everybody? Do you know what you have as the proof? It isn't what verse you can quote me from this book. It isn't your, your, your little gold star attendance record to Sunday school. 
It isn't how much money you've given to the church. You want to prove there's a living God? Let him transform you. Because as your life is transformed before your friends, before your co-workers, before your, your enemies, when God changes you from within by that work of his spirit in your spirit, there's no denying. They'll go, oh my gosh, there's a God. Look at Izzy's a pastor. There has to be a God. Come on. They want real proof. What do you submit as your real proof that there's a living God? You submit you as a living and holy sacrifice, the Bible says, present yourselves alive to God. Here I am, God, use me. Change me. Do what you got to do in me. And as he does that in us, do people watch us? You ever notice they're always watching? Like, they catch everything. You can't get away with nothing. Like, if I said a bad word right now, do you know how many people say, <clears throat> excuse me, Pastor, I don't think you should say that. You know, ass is not allowed. But it's in here. Jesus wrote on one. No, Pastor, don't say that. They watch us, don't they? And now I have to just use that word in the right context and not in the wrong context. Because they are watching to see if we change. And if we get changed, it speaks to the world volumes. It says, there is a living God working in all of these lives, all the way around, and he's changing all these people from within. He's transforming them, renewing them. And they go, wow, I could use that. I want to encourage you this week, walk by the Spirit. Don't do the stuff of the flesh. If you walk by the Spirit, it says you will overcome the flesh. And if you should slip up and the flesh out a little, I'm not giving you excuses here, but I am going to remind you of Romans 8. How much condemnation is there for you? None. Does God know that we even were, the Bible says, we're weak. And he says, the psalm says, he is mindful that we are but dust. We're just dust. You know, he knows we have a weak frame. We're just dust. That doesn't make us sound all that strong, does it? They're just but dust. But technically, that's what we are. Chemically, our bodies are just the same as our closest kin aren't the apes, by the way. It's the dirt on the ground. We're just the same chemical composition, add water. And add a little bit of the thing called the breath of life from who? Who breathed into Adam's nostrils after he made a, a little dirt clod man? You guys know that, right? In the Bible, the whole first story is God took the dirt, the dust of the ground, and fashioned it into this guy called Adam. And there he was, this little dirt clod. Not alive, but God took and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. And Adam became a living being. Only God can do that. By the way, that's why the Bible says, you know, some people say ashes to ashes, dust to dust, but it's not the ashes to ashes, it's dust to dust. We came from the dust. If you ever wonder why they say that at a funeral, it's because we came from the dust. And if you don't believe me, once they put you, even if they embalm you, they put you in the thing after a long time, guess what you turn back into? Dust. It's dust to dust. So let's not get so hung up on our dust. The dust is going to perish. Your flesh is going to be gone. It's your spirit that will live forever. And I want to encourage you, God wants your spirit to live with him forever in paradise, in heaven. Not, not in torment with the, with the devil who rebelled. The devil does want people to join him, though. He's a creep. Misery loves company. He, he wants people to go to hell with him. But that's not God's will. And, and we need to tell people, it is not God's will for anyone to perish. It's God's will for you to go to heaven. And if you don't believe it, look at my life. No. <clears throat> some of you may be saying, no, no, I don't want him to look at my life. There's some things wrong. I have just identified areas for improvement. This is your self-help tip for the day. You want to know where you need to grow in the spirit? 
That's all it takes. Just if you have something you wouldn't want to show to your child that you do, you just figured out a spot to improve. If you want to really have accelerated growth in the spirit, teach Sunday school. You know why? Because they look at you and go, you shouldn't say that. I don't think my mom would want you to do that. They can't, they bust you on every, you know, you taught little ones, right? Do little ones bust you on every, you're like, oh my God, you, it cleaned you up, man. It's quick. It's a little bit cutting, but I guess right to the nitty gritty. And that's what Paul is saying to this church. Walk by the spirit and you won't have to do the stuff of the flesh. You're freed from it. You will actually be able to overcome. And if you should blow it, how much condemnation is there as we end? None. Don't let the devil whip it out on you because he loves to condemn. He's the pro at condemning. He stands before God in the book of Revelations, it says, day and night. And what does he do? Accuses the brethren. Did you see Izzy? Didn't you see what he blew it? Oh, he's a... Dup, 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 dup. And thankfully, I have an advocate named Jesus. And he stands up on my behalf and says, Objection, Your Honor. Objection. And who's the, who's the judge up there? God. Before God, our Father, he stands up and he says, and I'm standing up there, cameraman. Sorry, I learned this last week. I stood up and he wasn't paying attention. And they filmed me from, the, from here to here. They were like looking at my Bible for a while. Hey, we did not claim to be professionals at this. We're just doing the best we can, so bear with. But Jesus stands up on my behalf and he says, objection. And what's his objection? I paid for that. I paid for that. And, and you know what God does? He says, dismissed, next case. But you know, Satan doesn't quit, does he? He just goes on to the next person. St did you see what Steve did? did you, you know, he picks on every one of us. Day and night. The accuser of the brethren. What a title. A jerk. By the way, if you really want to tell someone to go to hell, he's the only one you get to tell. Go to hell, Satan. That's right. He's going there anyway. But, I mean, don't tell other people because it is not God's will for a person to go to hell. It's God's, only the devil and his angels that fell, the fallen angels, the demons, they're the ones going to hell. God doesn't want any of us to go to hell. And I want to get that word out. While there's still time, I want to tell people, God wants to give you everlasting life. Don't pass on it. It is the greatest gift, and it is the sweetest thing, and God wants you to have it. And you guys can help me get that word out just by living a life that you let God change you from within. They'll see you. They'll go, oh, wow, you, didn't you used to... That's a nice line, by the way. If they, if, if, if they say to you, weren't you the one that used to have like a bad temper? And weren't you the guy that used to fight all the time? <laughs> For me, it was the guy who used to get in fights. And weren't you the guy that broke that guy's arm and did that other thing to that? I, I, no. I, I'm like, we don't want to remember that. Do we like to remember our bad things? No. But the good part is I'm not, the guy, I'm not that guy anymore. And I want you to join me in being works in progress, being transformed, being works that walk after the spirit and not the flesh. And we'll be free together. And people will see it and they'll say, there is a God. We can help a lot of folks just by living. You can't just say, yeah, I'm, I, I believe in the spirit, but I don't walk by the spirit. That, that doesn't fly. Paul had to tell the Galatian church, if you say you, you live by the spirit, he said, then walk it this is basically walk the talk really do the things of the spirit if if you're not sure about what that all means come back next week i'll break it down the whole fruits of the spirit maybe a little more detail and we're going to do just a smidge of the next chapter so read ahead for me and uh and go on the youtube and do what thumbs up and subscribe if you don't mind, if you haven't already. Even if you never watch one of the subscribe thing, it'll automatically tell you when the next video gets loaded. But some of you can click it for me. And, and, and for those of you stuck in the snow when you go home, 
you just miss us, just click it and let it play. It'll play through the whole playlist, and they can just feel like they're back in Hawaii on vacation and joining us, right? Would you guys join me? Let's all stand and sing a closing song, let you go in the joy of the Lord, and, and just see what he has for you to do in the spirit this, this week. May his spirit guide you and lead you. And we pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.